Hi guys, in this video we'll be looking at types of respiration, an introduction to glycolysis, the stages of glycolysis, the final products of glycolysis, and then we'll finish with a summary. So respiration can happen whether there is a presence of oxygen or if there isn't a presence of oxygen. So it can occur both with and without oxygen. So oxygen obviously exists as a gas in the environment we live in, which is the formula O2, and the respiration can occur if it's present or if it's absent. When respiration occurs in the presence of oxygen, we call this respiration aerobic respiration. Because when oxygen is present, it's almost describing the fact that there is air, and so we call it aerobic. However, when respiration occurs without oxygen, we call it anaerobic respiration. In biology, an in front of something tends to mean without. For example, analgesic means without pain. So anaerobic respiration, means without oxygen. Aerobic respiration produces a much greater number of ATP molecules than anaerobic. So if oxygen is present, the processes that happen in aerobic respiration produce more ATP than if oxygen is absent and we have anaerobic respiration. So this means that aerobic respiration is more desirable because the cell can produce more energy from particular molecules. So oxygen being present is favourable because we make more ATP, which means we have more energy to do things. Aerobic respiration occurs in both the cytoplasm and the mitochondria because there are different steps, whereas anaerobic respiration is only limited to the cytoplasm. So anaerobic has a particular pathway and only happens in the cytoplasm, whereas aerobic has steps in both the cytoplasm and in the mitochondria. So respiration is broken up into different stages, and one of the first stages is glycolysis. Glycolysis is the first stage of respiration, and it happens in both aerobic and anaerobic respiration. So whether oxygen is present or whether oxygen is absent, the first part of respiration is glycolysis. This is guaranteed to happen any time. So glycolysis is basically a set of reactions, which is the first stage of respiration. In glycolysis, a glucose molecule is taken into the cell and it's converted to two molecules of pyruvate. So remember, glucose is our main substrate for respiration. And every time we have one glucose, it's converted in glycolysis to two different molecules, and these are pyruvate. It's really important that you remember there are two of these, one and two. So every one glucose gives two pyruvate molecules. The pyruvate molecule is a three carbon molecule which is used differently whether it goes into aerobic or anaerobic respiration. So essentially, glycolysis happens whether oxygen is present or not. And in glycolysis, we have one glucose every time turning into two pyruvate. And depending if oxygen is present or not, it can go one of two ways. If oxygen is present, it goes down a particular pathway. However, if oxygen is absent, it goes down a different pathway. But up to this point, everything is the same. The process of glycolysis can be split into three stages. The first part is phosphorylation of glucose. So in this stage, we take our glucose molecule and we turn it into basically a form of glucose which has been phosphorylated, which basically means we've added phosphate groups to the glucose. Once we've done this, the second part is the splitting of the phosphorylated glucose in half. So we've got glucose here with its phosphorylations, and essentially it splits into two molecules. So it's split down the middle. And then the third stage is oxidation of the split glucose molecules to form the pyruvate. So we now have these two split molecules, and each of them goes through a process of oxidation, which we'll talk about in more detail, until we end up with our two final products, two molecules of pyruvate. We'll go through these steps in a bit more detail in the next slide, but first of all we need to note that when we carry out these steps, glycolysis requires the help of a particular molecule, and this molecule is a coenzyme and it's called NAD, which stands for a longer word, but just writing NAD is fine. So the NAD molecule is used in the process of glycolysis. The purpose of NAD is that it helps enzymes, because it is a coenzyme, carrying out the removal of hydrogen atoms from molecules. So say this was a particular molecule, doesn't matter what it is, 
and on the molecule we have these hydrogen atoms attached to it. For example, fats and oils have lots of hydrogen atoms on them. Particular enzymes are designed to remove hydrogens from molecules, leaving just the molecule behind. And the NAD is used to help these enzymes to carry out this function. So it's helping enzymes take hydrogens away from things. When we have a removal of hydrogen atoms, the type of reaction this is is called an oxidation reaction. So anytime we have a molecule going from a state where it has hydrogen atoms to where it loses those hydrogen atoms, this type of reaction is called oxidation. So we've said that NAD helps this reaction. So how does it do this? Well, it helps the enzymes catalyze oxidation reactions by accepting and carrying the hydrogen atoms that have been removed. So say there's a particular enzyme catalyzing this molecule losing its hydrogen atoms. The NAD is there as a helper to take the burden of those hydrogen ions and then that molecule is left without any hydrogen ions. So it's a carrier of the hydrogen atoms. Whereas the enzyme is more interested in focusing the reaction on removing the hydrogen ions where NAD can then take them. So let's go through the stages of glycolysis in more detail. The first step of glycolysis, as we mentioned, was adding two phosphate molecules to a glucose molecule, and this produces a new molecule called hexose bisphosphate. So just to illustrate that, we've started with our molecule of glucose, and all we've done is add two phosphate groups. So this is that first stage of glycolysis called phosphorylation, because now what we've got are the same glucose molecule with two phosphate groups added to it. And this is called hexose because it's still a six carbon sugar, bisphosphate. When you see when you see bi or bis in biology or chemistry, it tends to mean two. So a two phosphate containing six sugar, hexose bisphosphate. This process is called glucose phosphorylation because we've phosphorylated glucose. And the reason for this is it makes the glucose more reactive so that later it can be split more easily. So glucose as a molecule isn't that reactive, but when we add particular groups to it, i.e. these phosphate groups, it makes it more reactive. Because ideally what we're going to be doing next is splitting the glucose in half. It's very hard to do this as it is glucose, but with phosphate groups it seems to strain it and make it more reactive. The two phosphate molecules are taken from two ATP molecules and the ATPs get hydrolyzed to obtain the phosphate. So ATP comes from somewhere else in the cell, and basically it's hydrolyzed to leave ADP plus these phosphate groups. So because we're having one and two phosphate groups, we need two ATPs to become ADP and PI. So the one goes there and one goes here. So the turning of glucose to glucose uh, to hexose bisphosphate uses two ATPs. Then we need to talk about the splitting. So the hexose bisphosphate, which is now very reactive, can be split to produce two molecules of triose phosphate. So here's our hexose bisphosphate from before. And it's very reactive because of these two phosphate groups. And it simply splits down the middle. And each of these molecules is now called triose phosphate. So the way to think about this is that it's split down this part here, leaving one, two, three carbons on one, hence the triose, and one, two, three on the other, and this will also be called triose. And they're called phosphate, not bisphosphate, because they only each now have one phosphate. So we have an equal split down the middle. This is where the enzymes which use NAD come into play. Enzymes known as dehydrogenase enzymes, or dehydrogenases, remove a hydrogen atom from each of the triose phosphate molecules. So we talked about how we can remove hydrogen atoms from groups of molecules, and this is done by enzymes. The name of these enzymes are the dehydrogenases, because they are dehydrogenating, i.e. taking hydrogen off, a particular molecule. So it does this for each of the triose molecules. Remember there's one and two, and we take off these hydrogens for each molecule. We've said before how the removal of hydrogen atoms is called oxidation, so this is the third part of glycolysis, and each hydrogen atom gets accepted and carried by a molecule of NAD. So remember, NAD is used to help the enzyme remove hydrogen atoms by carrying that hydrogen atom and accepting it. 
and of course it will happen for the other molecule too. So now we have two molecules which have lost their hydrogen atoms and we formed two molecules of NAD which have now each got this little hydrogen atom attached to them. The NAD molecules which now have hydrogen atoms on them are described as reduced. The reduced NAD molecules are important because they'll be used later on in the respiration process. So right now it doesn't seem so clear as to why we're making NAD with the hydrogen on it, but these are used later on and they'll be very important and we'll talk about them in other videos. At this point, the phosphates which are on each of those triose phosphate molecules are then used to produce two ATP molecules each. So we've got our triose phosphate on each side, number one and number two, and they have phosphate groups. And actually it's used to produce two ATP each side. It might not seem clear as to why, because we have one phosphate making two ATP, but it does so through different chemical steps. So just remember that one triose phosphate is going to make two ATP. So therefore, if you think about it, in this reaction, four ATP are produced altogether. Because so we have two triose phosphates, they each make two, so we have four ATP altogether. While this is happening, two molecules of pyruvate get made from the removal of these phosphates and these are produced from the two triose phosphate molecules. So these go off to form ATP, as do these, and in doing so, this triose phosphate becomes a pyruvate, and then so does this one too. So we end up with two pyruvate molecules. And that's the end of glycolysis. So to sum up glycolysis, let's go through the final products. Each glucose molecule in glycolysis produces two pyruvate molecules, so these are the two end molecules we end up with. And each pyruvate molecule has three carbons. We've made two reduced NAD molecules because when the triose phosphates were dehydrogenated, the NAD molecule each took a hydrogen atom from them. And a net of two ATP molecules. The reason for this is at the beginning, we made phosphorylated glucose. And when we did this, we had to use two ATP to donate those phosphates in hydrolysis. In the step towards the end, where the triose phosphates became pyruvate, the phosphates came off of the triose phosphate to form two ATP. And because there were two triose phosphates, this happened twice. So at this point, we had two ATP made. But then that's times two, so actually we formed four ATP. So because we've used two ATP and we've made four, we make two net overall. So one glucose forms two ATP at the end of glycolysis. And remember, it's net amount. So we've already made some ATP by the end of glycolysis. Hey guys, I hope you enjoyed the video. If you're looking for an amazing A-level biology resource, join me today in my series of engaging bite-sized video tutorials. Just click the Snap Revise smiley face, and together, let's make A-level biology a walk in the park.